Please make sure to fill out the friendship card at the end of each pew. For prayer requests, please look at the bulletin. And Richard Putnam has an announcement. Uh, good morning. Uh, I just got a short little spill. Uh, we're going back to Romania this week, and the organization is called NOROC, N-O-R-O-C, if you happen to want to look it up in the inter internet. And uh, I went last year. I was fortunate enough to be able to go last year. Uh, <clears throat> this organization has been around for, I don't know, probably close to three decades now, two or three decades and they help support a orphanage in Tulcha, which is on the Danube River, Danube River right across from Ukraine. And um, last year we went and we just did a lot of construction, maybe. I mean, this year we're doing a little bit of that, but we're getting to work with the kids a lot. So we've got um, 90 kids that were broken up in different groups that we're working with doing day camps. And I'm not sure they realized how little Richard has in the way of, you know, of expertise in kid day camps, but here we are. And um, so anyway, we'll be there for between two to three weeks. And it's mainly with the orphanage. And they do sometimes gather supplies to send across the river into Ukraine for the internally displaced persons from the war. Uh, so I'm just here to ask for your prayers, your thoughts, and if you want to learn some more about Norok, just look on the internet and it should tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Let us prepare for worship as we listen to the prelude. Let us join in the call to worship. 
Come now, my friends, into this, the house of the Lord. Come, Come now into, into this, the very presence, presence of the Lord God Almighty. It is God who calls us, the one who is without beginning and who has no end. A God, a God merciful and mighty. A God of love and forgiveness. Come, Come now, my friends, to this, the house of the Lord. be seated. If we claim to be without sin, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sins, God is just and may be trusted to forgive us and to cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Let us turn our sins over to God as we pray together. Please join in the prayer of confession. Loving God, you have promised that not one sparrow can fall from the sky apart from your knowledge. And yet, we allow our lives to be filled with doubt and uncertainty. Where are you, we ask? Do you care, we wonder? Will you really save us? Forgive our weakness, O God. Banish our fear and timidity. Make us strong and courageous as we continue the work of Jesus in this world and keep us faithful until he comes again to claim us for the world. Okay. Hear us, Father, as we continue to pray in the silence of our hearts. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news of the gospel. Through Christ's death and resurrection, we are made into a new creation, ready to sing to God's glory and to testify to God's grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hear this word and rejoice. The peace of God be with you all. Let us offer signs of peace and reconciliation.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, you may be seated. Are you already seated? <laughs> As we are gathered here today, we ask you, our living God, to cover us with your wisdom and knowledge. We pray that as we listen to your word, we will have the ability to see clearly what God has called us to do. We seek to fulfill your purpose in our lives so we can see your kingdom. Loom in our eyes, God, and reveal to us your glory. Amen. Our New Testament lesson comes from Mark 4, 26 through 34. He also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise at night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which sown upon the ground. It's the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to say thanks to Richard for volunteering to go off to Romania for the next couple of weeks. Uh, this uh, congregation has supported that ministry over the years, and it is a ministry also of our presbytery. So we're very glad that uh, we're participating in that way, uh, not only uh, writing a check, but, but sending actual people. I know uh, others in the congregation have been there over the years. If you haven't been there yet, you might. Next summer's coming, and it could be your turn to, uh, to take that trip and see what uh, the Lord has in store. Second lesson today comes from 2 Corinthians. This is the third of our series of six sermons from 2 Corinthians. Today we are in chapter 5, and we'll begin reading at verse 6. Let us listen now for the word of God to us on this day. So we are always confident, even, know, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we ourselves are well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ urges us on it because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything is becoming new. All this is from God, 
who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Week three in the city of Corinth, Paul faces still another problem in his role as apostle, one that we have yet to mention. As we've already seen, his detractors, his critics, lodge all manner of complaint against him. His personal appearance, for instance, he just doesn't look the part. His lack of charisma, absence of magnetism, especially when you meet him in person. The fact that he's been afflicted in so many ways, beset on every side by one problem after the other. Paul's critics take all of these negatives as indication that he's less than he should be. If he were really an apostle, runs this line of thinking, he'd be powerful, charming, dynamic. If he were really an apostle, he'd be, well, successful. But Paul, as we've discovered, argues just the opposite. Speaking from a position not of strength, but of weakness. Indeed, he even goes so far as to present worldly success as a form of heavenly failure. The message of the gospel, as Paul says, precious treasures in earthly vessels. But now in week three, we come to still another issue to a question not of interpretation, but of fact. Paul's critics, the ones who have gone on to Corinth to take over his work, to correct his work, many of them were privileged to have seen Jesus in this life, to have known him personally, according to the flesh, as Paul says in verse 16 of our text today, kata sarka in the Greek. Looking back to the first chapter of the book of Acts, all of the believers, around 120 of them, are said to be gathered in the upper room. They've just seen Jesus ascend into heaven, and they've been told to go back to Jerusalem and wait there for a sign that would tell them what to do next. So they're just sort of biding their time, I guess we would say, hanging out, according to the younger ones. And Peter, remember him? Good old Peter stands up to argue for the need to elect an apostle to take the place of Judas the betrayer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, says Peter, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. One of these, says he, must be a witness with us to the resurrection. Well then, the simple fact is Paul, formerly known as Saul, does not meet these criteria. As far as we know, he never saw Jesus during his earthly life, never walked with him, never heard him teach, never witnessed in person, katasarka, any of the miracles, feeding of the 5,000, stilling the waters, sight to the blind, rescue to the captives. But on the other hand, and in contrast to Paul, at least some of his opponents there in Corinth have in fact been in the actual living presence of our Lord. Maybe not all the way from his baptism to the ascension, as Peter says, but some of that time at least, actual witnesses at least, 
more than our friend Paul can say. All he has to fall back on to appeal to is his rather vague, highly mystical conversion experience. And even that came at a time when he was not only not a believer, but an actual persecutor of Christians. Remember Paul, when he was named Saul, stood by approvingly as his friends, his associates, stoned Stephen to death, the first Christian martyr. He then goes and gets warrants against Christians in Damascus, heading to that city with the intention of arresting people and bringing them back to face trial, perhaps be put to death. It's only then, on the road to Damascus, that he's knocked off his horse with a vision from heaven, an experience leading to his becoming a firm believer in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So, picture yourself, some years later, an average churchgoer, in the city of Corinth. You've heard the gospel. Could have been Paul you heard it from. At any rate, it struck a chord, took root in your soul and began to grow. Same thing happening to others of your friends and neighbors until a church, a community of faith took shape, became established. But in the course of time, Paul has to leave, be on his way. Never intended to stay in Corinth forever, you know. So off he goes. Well, others come there to that city to continue his work of leading the church. And so the weeks go by until gradually it becomes more and more apparent that these others differ with Paul on certain key points of the gospel. Now, these replacement leaders, these new ones, they, they came here from Jerusalem. That is to say, from the mother church in the home city. Headquarters, I guess we would say. Some of them, at least, had actually known Jesus during his earthly life, had walked with him, talked with him, heard him teach and seen him heal the sick. All this in person, katasarka, as they say, according to the flesh. So, there you are, a well-ordered churchgoer in the city of Corinth. Now you tell me, who are you going to believe? Paul, with his weighty leathers, or these other ones with their eyewitness accounts, their firsthand experiences, the appeal of the flesh, of the senses, of what we think of as the real, the actual. All of this is amazingly strong. There's an interesting feature to Paul's letters. It's the infrequency with which he refers specifically to the life of Christ. The infrequency with which he quotes from the stories and sayings of Jesus. The virgin birth, to take just one example, it's a tenet of the faith, often cited as the, the very basis for orthodox belief. But Paul never mentions this once. So the question arises, does he even know about the virgin birth. Well, predictably, scholars, such as they are, take both sides of this issue. Some argue that he was largely ignorant of the Jesus tradition. The Gospels, after all, were not even written for a good 15 or 20 years after Paul wrote his letters. The answer is simple, says this position. Paul doesn't refer to the Jesus tradition because he doesn't know about it. Well, others find it inconceivable that Paul could have done all that he did, could have known all the people he knew without having become thoroughly familiar with the stories of Jesus. So the argument here says he didn't refer explicitly to the traditional narrative about the life of Jesus because he didn't have to, because everyone already knew all about it. A received and commonly held body of knowledge argues this way of thinking such as that need not find explicit expression in Paul's letters. 
Indeed, some even suggest Paul avoids referring to specifics of Jesus' life for the very reason discussed above, since he himself was not an eyewitness to that life, any references he would make would necessarily be secondhand. A distinct disadvantage in arguing with his detractors, many of whom had, in fact, known Jesus, Katasarka. From now on, therefore, writes Paul, we regard no one from a human point of view, that is to say, according to the flesh, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. He once knew Christ according to the flesh, that is to say, according to the thoughts and beliefs of a non-Christian. He once viewed Christ in a limited fleshly sort of way. He looked at Jesus and saw nothing but a troublemaker, someone misleading the masses, deluding the ignorant, someone whose followers ought to be persecuted, arrested, even put to death. But now, some years later, Paul sees Jesus differently. No longer with eyes of flesh, but now with eyes of faith. We too are invited to see Jesus with eyes of faith. In this sense, we are closer to Paul than to his detractors, for we ourselves have never had the opportunity, as far as I know, to meet Jesus in this physical life either. If we're going to know Jesus at all, we will know him not according to the flesh, but according to faith. In this sense, Paul provides a vital transition between what may have become a re religion of personality, a cult of people who had known Jesus in the flesh, to a time when people who have never known Jesus personally, fleshly, are invited to come to know him according to the Spirit. So we are confident, writes Paul, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, being at home in the body means being away from the Lord. If we walk by sight, if we live, if we behave in a worldly sort of way, katasarka, then we are indeed separated from the Lord. But if we walk by faith, even though we are at home in the body, if we walk by faith, we walk with Jesus. This means, says Paul, that we already have a partial fellowship with Christ, even now. But when we die, then, when we die, this fellowship will be full and complete. For now we walk by faith, then we will see fully, even as we have been fully seen. Paul saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, and through faith he enjoys a real relationship with that Christ. But one day, when he dies, he will see Christ again and see him even more fully, even more gloriously than he saw him on that dusty road to Damascus. Yes, we do have confidence, says he, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So once again, we see the idea of death as a transition, death as a completion. We are already united with Christ. We will die a death even as he did, that is to say a physical death, the demise of the body, of the flesh. But we are also united with Christ in baptism, through the waters of baptism. In this way, Jesus lives in us and we in him. And so as he partakes in our death, we also partake in his resurrection. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, says Paul. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. When Christ died, we all died but not to be dead and gone, for we now enjoy new life. 
In the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, we read of God recreating the world that has turned away from God. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare, says Isaiah. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Through his cross and resurrection, Christ has already created his followers anew. And Paul does not mean by this that we've been given new ideals to live by, does not mean by this that we will experience a slow moral change brought about by some new desire to be good, such as that would be recreating ourselves, like, for instance, working out in the gym to lose weight, to get in shape, physically speaking. No, it's God who makes the new creation, even as God made the first creation. And just as, according to what we read in Genesis, just as the first creation was not a gradual process, neither is the second. It comes about in the death and resurrection of Christ. At that very moment, we as Christians become new people. That's the way God looks at us from that very moment. True, we still have to work out in the way we think and behave, living no longer kata sarka, but now kata krista, according to Christ. For some people, this happens more quickly than it does in others. But the same thing is taking place in all of us, for all have been raised in Christ. To paraphrase the old hymn, we are his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought us to be his holy bride. And with his own blood he bought us for our life. He died. All this is from God, says Paul, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors from Christ. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God and to one another. A message of reconciliation, an appeal for us to be reconciled to ourselves, to each other, and to our God. A message of recreation. We are not the same old people we used to be, Katasarka. A message of hope. God not counting our trespasses against us, or our deaths for that matter, but God making us ambassadors for Christ, holy emissaries, proclaiming a message of hope and forgiveness and reconciliation to all people everywhere. It's okay. We can go home again. We can go home to God. Few disputes could be more bitter, more urgent, more vital than that which Paul wages with his detractors in Corinth. Few attacks could be more personal, more hurtful, more spiteful than that which Paul suffers at the hands of those fellow Christians in Corinth. But even so, perhaps especially so, Paul urges a ministry of reconciliation. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Week three, in the city of Corinth, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
The affirmation of faith today comes in the words of the Nicene Creed. Let us stand as we affirm our faith together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather here and worship this morning. We are so grateful for our community of faith, for our long history in this town, for our new beginnings in this particular location. We ask that you would continue to guide us in this time when we continue our search for the new pastor who will lead us into the years to come. We thank you for every place where the name of Jesus is proclaimed, whether it be large or small, near or far away. We pray that the church would continue to be a beacon of hope for all the world, a sanctuary for the lost, the tired, the broken. We pray also that Christians would be people of love, acceptance, and goodwill among all people. To that end, give us, we ask, O God, wisdom and forbearance with each new day. Even as we give you thanks for this world in which we live, for the blessings which we find day by day, we pray also for those people caught in the violence of war, grinding on week after week. Men, women, and children continue to die in these conflicts, many others injured and suffering. We're not sure why or what to do about it. Send your spirit upon us, O God, and give us peace. Help the leaders of nations to be men and women of sound judgment, wise minds, and tender hearts. Be with us also as we wrestle with our own problems and dilemmas, whether it be matters of health, of family, of job or career, of finance or relationship, whatever keeps us awake at night, Give us understanding and acceptance as we trust in you for all things today and forevermore. Amen. We come once again to the Lord's table. This table doesn't belong to me or to this church or even to the Presbyterian church. It belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. It is he who invites us to come. This is the Lord's table. Our saviors invite those who trust in him to share this communion with him and with the faith, faithful of every land and nation. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Let us also come to the table that we may see the Lord with us still yet today. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God, we thank you for commanding light out of darkness, for dividing the waters into the sea and dry land, for creating the whole world and calling it good. We thank you for making us in your image to live with each other in love, for the breath of life, the gift of speech, the freedom to choose your way. You have told us your purpose and commandments to Moses, called for justice in the cry of the prophets. Through long generations, you have been fair and kind to all your children. Great and wonderful are your works, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. With the faithful of every time and place, we lift up our hearts in joyful praise.
Holy Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who lived with us sharing joy and sorrow. He told your story, healed the sick, and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was crucified. We praise you that he is not dead, but is risen to rule the world. And he is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring us into your promised kingdom, we will celebrate the victory with the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks that our Lord Jesus, on the, on the night of his arrest, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke that bread. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Also, after that supper, our Lord took a cup. And he said to his disciples, this cup is a new covenant poured out for you in my blood. Drink all of you from this cup. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. My friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Thank you. 
Let us pray. God, our help, we thank you for this supper shared in the spirit with your son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today for worship. As always, we invite you to come back next Sunday. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring someone that doesn't like you. Have them sit next to you in the pew here in this church. I charge us now to go out into this world seeking to find someone who hasn't heard the name of Jesus or having heard it left him cold and he didn't understand. Share the good news. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit go with you and keep you today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.